writer James Whitcomb Riley. The Reverend Whitmore lost his wife on the boat before arriving in Oregon and before the month was out, his mother-in-law and another of her daughters. <clears throat> All are buried in the famous Pioneer Cemetery at the University in Eugene, Oregon. The Reverend Whitmore remarried several years later, came to Bickleton and homesteaded next to his two daughters and he is buried in the IOOF Cemetery up on the hill. The first of the Whitmore family to arrive in the Juniper Canyon area were the two old maid aunts, Molly and Ernestine, in 1899. Aunt Molly was a milliner, which made hats, and Ernest was a school teacher. They each had a homestead side by side and built their home on the line with a bedroom on the division line so that they could live together and still prove up on their claims. <laughs> Pretty creative. <laughs> Ernest taught at Bickleton a short while at the Larson Jensen School. That little schoolhouse is part of our museum now. Both ladies participated in running the New York Racquet Club, which was a dress shop across the street west of the Bickleton Bank. Their father and stepmother and many other families migrated here at the same time from the Mohawk Valley, east of Eugene, Oregon. Several of the names were Yarnell, Zumwalt, Jordan, Waugh, and Ingram. We have a newspaper article where Reverend Jordan performed the marriage of a Whitmore, and later Reverend Whitmore performed a Jordan marriage. Molly and Ernest's brother, Tom Whitmore, and wife Nellie Cole followed in 1902. They came in September and by winter had a two-story house up and also a barn by February. They had three children, Del, Hazel, and baby Burl. Hazel returned to the Mohawk Valley to take care of her grandparents, and Burl married Charlie Churchill. Their older brother, Del Whitmore, married Fern Churchill in 1926. He was 32 years old and had been too busy farming to think of getting married. Fern's family came from Plattsmouth, Nebraska in 1899, and a few members of her family homesteaded in the Crider Valley, as did a whole lot of folks from Nebraska. One of those was the Graves, who founded Blue Light, and also the Gray family, who still have property in Crider Valley. The Churchill family brought with them the mother-in-laws, excuse me, mother-in-law, Mrs. Hewitt, who brought with her five sons, and they settled in Juniper Canyon. The old lady Hewitt had a post office in her home until it burned in 1908. Frank Churchill, the father of Fern Whitmore, enjoyed pet rattlesnakes, as some of you know. In his love letters to Eva Hewitt, when he was traveling to New Oklahoma in 1897, he promised her to give them up. It never happened. <laughs> in her diary in the 1920s, she mentioned that fact. The story goes that while they were living in Juniper Canyon, he had a building full of them at least a hundred. And somehow the door got left open and they all got away. It's amazing that he never had a problem being bitten by one. Tom and Nellie Whitmore returned to Oregon when Dell and Fern were married in 1926. And Dell and Fern took over the homestead. They had four children. Ethel, Lawrence, came a year later, and one week, excuse me, after Ethel, was Eileen Wilhelm, Bowden, and Betty Jo Berger. Way behind the other three. Dell was the only one to have children and grandchildren to carry on the Whitmore name from the Reverend John Houston line. We might mention that Fern Churchill Whitmore was born in a little house just a half mile east of the Bickleton High School. There is no one to carry on the Churchill name from her grandfather, George Churchill. And then just to complicate the story, George was a brother to Levi Churchill, who Delmer Albritton was descended from. Lawrence and Ada Ruth were married on Christmas Eve in 1947. They moved to the Whitmore Homestead in 1951. They had five children and named it the Hoopenhaller Ranch. They celebrated their 60th anniversary with all their descendants present for the day. Both of them graduated from Bigelton High School, so have all their grandchildren and several of the grandchildren. The Rasmussen family started with Olaf Johann Wilhelm Rasmussen, and he went by John Rasmussen. His stepfather was Danish and spelled his Rasmussen name with an E on the end, but John was a Swede, so he spelled it O-N uh, with the last two letters. John migrated to the U.S. in 1882 and sent for Emily Nelson in 1886. She arrived in Alkali, which became Arlington, Oregon, and no one was there to meet her. John had been there the day before. She stayed with the Lund family in Dot for a few days until the arrangements were made for their wedding on October 7, 1886. She had two sisters following her over later. Marie married Gastel Benz and lived on Old Lady Canyon. Hilda married Wesley Payne and they lived at the foot of Newell Grade before moving to Lebanon, Oregon. 
John and Emily had nine children and raised eight of them, sending them to the Oak Grove Schoolhouse on Newell Road. They were Ida, Mrs. Arthur Vincent, Ellen, Mrs. Walter Tarble, Tina, who was Mrs. Ed White, Emma, Mrs. Everett Schwanz, Frank, Ulrich, Derman, and Wesley. John had a homestead at Oak Grove and worked out while Emily raised the children for several years. All of the boys learned to herd sheep and the girls run the house very efficiently. The Nielsen family in Sweden were in charge of the kitchens on a large estate in Malmo. Emily carried a crochet hook and thread in her apron at all times. One of her best friends was Mary Carter from up on the hill near the reservation. Mary Carter came in the fall and intended to go back to Oregon, but when all those beautiful flowers came out in the spring, she changed her mind. In those days, when you visited someone, you usually spent the night. We have pictures of the Carters at the Rasmussen Ranch. Son Derman Rasmussen met Jewel Porter at a dance in the Biggleton garage. His brother Wesley had brought her up from the Yakima Valley, as a lot of the Biggleton boys still do. And then Grandpa <laughs> married her. <laughs> a granddaughter of Soren Matson has pictures of the piano used for the dances held in the Grange, excuse me, in the garage. Jewel Porter was born in California as her folks were migrating from Missouri across the states and ended up in the Yakima Valley where she grew up. Dermot and Jewel were married in 1928 and raised four children, Ada Ruth, Philip, Bill Joe, and Mike. Lawrence and Ada have retired from many community projects and spent many years organizing a museum containing many of their family treasures. The museum is closed for now until the family makes future plans. LD and Ada intend to just spend time visiting friends and doing more family research. Thank you, Mom. I'd like to do a rebuttal on that, but I might just turn away. <laughs> when I get through with this speech, you'll see how what the troubles we had getting here, and when they were just like that this morning. <laughs> what is it? They say a, a parent, set of parents can raise 10 kids, but 10 kids can't raise a set of parents, take care of a set of parents. Yeah. That's the way it was this morning. <laughs> and you know, we forgot, we wanted to show the new baby off in her grandfather's dress, her great-great-grandfather, uh, Del Whitmore's baby dress. In, in, in this is a dress from February 1893, and Delano is gonna show her off. Is it too windy, Del, to show her off? It's the newest member of our family. Del has three stepchildren, but this is our first great-grandchild. That, which makes Jack a grandfather now. <laughs> there she is, in great grandpa's dress. <laughs> grandpa Dell would have loved that. Thank you, Dell. Yeah. I'm going to do 80 years of memories. And one of the kids says it's kind of short, but if I veer off of it, then I wouldn't get back onto it. So I'm gonna just read it straight through. And 80 years of memories. Memories help keep close to us times that mean the most to us. This is such an honor to be standing here as a president of the historical Alder Creek Pioneer Picnic. Lawrence thinks he may have missed two, and I know I have missed one. The first picnic after we were married it was quite a dilemma which family we should eat with. In those days, the picnic lunch was an important part of the day with a huge cloth spread on the ground and everyone sitting in a circle eating. The second year, we were prepared. We had talked to both sets of parents and asked if we could join forces, and it was open house to whoever we wanted to invite to eat with us. What fun that has been. Our dads were quite opposite, so it has been very interesting to meet who showed up at our lunch. <laughs> One time we counted 62 who ate with us. Ethel noticed two little boys who kept coming back, filling their plates. We finally decided they didn't belong to anyone in our group, but they sure did have a good meal. <laughs> Another time, one of the homesteaders from out west of Cleveland thought we were a food stand. <laughs> well, Lord sold him his dinner for $10, and he cleaned, he cleaned up all the bowls, and he never bothered to use the plate. We could usually count on Lawrence's dad to bring strawberries from his first picking. 
Now granddaughter Susan Wright brings her sweet rolls. And then there were the committees that Lawrence and I were on. Sometimes they were fun, sometimes a lot of work. And I thought Lawrence was on that merry-go-round forever. I thought 20 years, but he said it was less. And you know, we all think we own that merry-go-round part of it. It was a lot of work and a fun committee, but that he was on that when our kids were small. So it, it was a problem some days. One of those years, Carolyn and Jack had to ride in the parade, and that meant get the horses ready and get them up to Cleveland. It was too far for them to ride from home. It was a very tight schedule. So Lawrence brought our little camp trailer up the night before. We were there early to get the tractor ready to run the merry-go-round. Lawrence's schedule got even tighter when he discovered someone had locked the trailer house door. <laughs> he pried that little door open on the side, pushed Jack in, and then Jack, Jack had to kick the door open under the bed and crawl through to unlock the door. <laughs> that taken care of, here come Carolyn down the hill. She had lost her bill, fold down the hole in the outhouse. <laughs> A, a quick conflab with the men standing around. They just thought it was early enough in the day and it shouldn't be too bad, so off they went. Dipped the outhouse ahead and fished the billfold out. Well, at lunchtime, I heard one of our guests say, I've really got to go to the bathroom. But you know, I'm afraid to go up there on that hill. I saw some men trying to tip one over on the lady this morning. <laughs> Back to our lunches. Lawrence's Uncle Pete lived with us off and on, and he really enjoyed the picnic. We asked him if he'd like to take care of the coffee pot. We took the little green cap stove and set it on the end of the table, and he took over from there. Poured the water in, dumped the coffee in, and we had sheep camp coffee. <laughs> Tasted pretty good on a cold day. I really miss that. And he called me Ida instead of Ada, and before we leave the house, he'd say, Ida, did you get the coffee in? One, one fall, Lawrence decided he had better take some boards up and enclose the merry-go-round. We drove right up beside the carousel building and out came three little Nygaard boys. There were four, so we guessed the other one was still inside. <laughs> Lawrence sauntered over with his boards, hammer and nails, and he started nailing. And one of those little boys starts yelling, my Clifford, my Clifford's in there. <laughs> I can still hear him hollering. And, and of course, Lawrence knew before he started mailing, Clifford was in there. From merry-go-round chairman, I think Lawrence went to dance chairman. Such huge crouch. You know you dance the next morning after dancing on that cement floor. Lawrence helped build a fence, and I think he helped spray paint it. As a small child, I could barely remember the old wooden floor made out of narrow tongue and groove boards. There was a scaffolding across the top, and I suppose they could put a canvas over the top if it rained. The ladies had long dresses on that evening. Lawrence has always been such good backup for so many of my projects, and he was there when my good friend Chloe Walling and I put the glancing back through the years book together. I thought we would whip that out in two months. <laughs> Took us a year, and Lawrence says a set of tires. <laughs> I went someplace every Thursday to visit someone to borrow pictures and sometimes in between. This was an idea this book was an idea. This book was an idea that Chloe had and she thought we could do it. She was the backup and I was the front man. And the first job was to convince someone to foot the bill. So she, she, we thought maybe the Pioneers would like, the Pioneer Association would like to do it. Well, the first trustee I went to turned me down flat. So I had another special friend, Harry Wilson. He just rounded up those trustees and pretended as though he did not know anyone had objected to doing this project. If it had not been for Mr. Wilson, we would not have had this special book. Harry died before we were finished, and we dedicated the book to him. I cannot tell you the history I learned as I traveled from house to house. I looked at hundreds of pictures. Those people took the time to visit and know how they hated to loan those pictures out. I slept with them, with all of them in a big box right beside our bed. 
And it was quite a worry to me when we started laying them out on Chloe's dining room table to research the background of each and every one. She did cross-examinations to make sure they were who they were supposed to be and that the dates were close. Chloe did not want to write a lot of details under each picture. That is the only disagreement we had. She did not want to debate the subjects. <laughs> I wish now I had written what she knew and told me about each one of those pictures and filed it away for later research. Lots of history was lost. A few folks could not loan their pictures and expressed to me later they wished they had. The books went to print a week or so before the Piner Picnic in 1969. I was so excited. We drove to Yakima to look at the first 10 and going home discovered a Bickleton page in the Roosevelt section and vice versa. That would never do, so called them from Sunnyside and they just did a different fold but it took time. We were down to the deadline the day before the picnic and they called and told me we could not pick them up till Saturday morning. There was Lawrence on the road pretty darn early and they got back to the picnic grounds soon after the morning program had started. Gary Larson had been waiting and bought the first one, and Tony Looney was not far behind. <laughs> Tony got signatures of every one he could find whose picture was in that book. And I wish he'd have brought it today. It's quite a book. In putting this book together, we were very fortunate to have Chloe in the Bickleton area, and both of our dads, Dell in the Six Prong Juniper Canyon area, and my dad in the Dot in Cleveland area. We were a bit weak in the Roosevelt area. The book has recently been reprinted for the fourth time and is on sale over here today for $15. Very good. <clears throat> there was a time we worked on a grant to build the new grandstand. I think that's the one you're sitting on. I was on the Klickitat County Bicentennial Planning Committee and the committee thought we should try for it. Milner Larson drew up the plans. Lowell Johnson, the county assessor, Lawrence and I, and I think Joe Roberts and a few other people, uh, we worked out some problems about being a nonprofit organization. The trustees attended a couple of meetings down the river with us, and lo and behold, we got one of the largest grants given by the state to build a new grandstand. <laughs> Miller took over the building, and I recall a lot of ladies doing a lot of painting, and I know Jan Brown did a lot of painting on it, out by Leona's house, wasn't it? Another memory is the year my dad was president. We had three kids, Christine, Tom, and Melinda, graduating from college at Ellensburg on the same day as the picnic. What would we do about that? I must have prayed real hard about it because it rained so much the picnic was postponed today. <laughs> <laughs> we got to go to both. <clears throat> Memories go back to before we were married, watching the high school band marching in the mud around the track. And that banner that I guess they can't, couldn't hang this year maybe, of when you first walk in, you see when you enter the picnic grounds, has always been like seeing the U.S. flag to me. And the year our 4-H group had a hamburger stand. We went to Eula Albritton's the day before and sliced three large bags of onions. Now that was something I never want to do again. <laughs> it was fun doing the stand, but that many onions is too much. Some years later, White Creek, stand had a, White Creek Grange had a pie stand. I baked 30 lemon pies one year. And I could hear my friend, Chloe Walling, reading the memorial list and the cows falling in the background. I do not know who was memorial chairman for the first picnic, but the first memorial list had three names on it. Had three names on it. Now, many people have revised the memorial list and it's a little confusing which, which were read at the picnic, but it's nice to have those names added. If we didn't have them there, we wouldn't be able to uh, do the research that we do. Um, Selma Darlin sent me the list her dad, Ed Flower, put together when he was memorial chairman in the 20s. And what a treasure that is. I have really enjoyed it. He used an old ledger book and wrote little tidbits on the side. And I would like to add here that all of you who have old pictures really need to date them and put names on them and write a story about them. You think you're going to remember, but you don't. The saddest picnic I can remember was after World War II was over. I had never seen men cry before. They did that day. There was a lot of hugging and back slapping. Several of our friends never made it home. World War I was ahead of my time. 
but there were names on the memorial list of those who never made it home. I recently read letters of one who did not come home from that war. That was Chloe Walling's brother, Henry Pendle. I have put together a total of 35 notebooks about the Pioneer Picnic covering the years of the Pioneer Picnic, and I'm always glad to have more pictures and information to add to those books. Our community is more aware than ever that we have a history to record. We have a great historical group formed here now with over 200 members and the stories are coming in and they're great. I wish all of you would think about writing your own story and sending it to our president, Linda Lassley, to file in the historical library. And um, Lawrence and I want to thank all of you for being a part of our lives and helping us with the, you know, make all of these memories. And I wonder if the trustees are here. Are any of the trustees here? They need to be thanked. They work so hard. Hi, Larry. These trustees are what keeps this program going. What? Oh, okay. Somebody else is supposed to thank the trustees. But I, 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 oh, okay. And Jan. Okay. Jan is the trustee. And Larry and uh, Corey. Corey Wilson. And who are the other two? Bill Mains and Mike Brown. And they do a tremendous job. And you know, this is just, the presidents don't have to do anything. It's just a, a name and, uh, you know, in front of a president name. But the trustees work. They work real hard. So they're, they're, give them a slap on the back when you meet them. Thank you. I saw Mylon come in. I'm not sure what your title is. You're involved with the economic, you're not? <laughs> Are you, with the economic development? Is that, that's not your title. Okay. <laughs> Have him come up and talk? I think he's a politician. <laughs> nice to have him, Island. <laughs> I'd now like to introduce Sherman Jensen as our um, past president, and he has a presentation to make. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What a fine group of pulchritude and handsomeness sits in that stand. <laughs> really enjoyable to watch you. And what hath God wrought? This family is really something, aren't they? Yeah. Lawrence and Ada have been a team for so long that I can almost remember the whole thing. <laughs> Their family has graced our community for a long time, and it really is a privilege for me to award in, be well, let me digress a little bit. There are people who sponsor and help us put on this picnic every year and some have provided services for years. And among them on your program are a couple who help with this. And one of them is really happy to have you avail yourselves of their service when you need them. <laughs> if you lock yourself out of your car, or if you're on your last leg, they're both available, but they generously provide a hat for the president. And there is one thing I'm looking forward to when I award this hat. I'm going to find out who the real president in the Whitmore family is. <laughs> You're going to wait to see if it comes up and gets it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they also uh, the lock shop, and they they present a nice plaque. So, you know, after this is over, 
and through the ensuing year, why they're going to recall this day and some of the memories that go with it. And he gives them a chance to look at something and they can cherish the memories of this day and of other days that we come here every year to celebrate. So it gives me great pleasure to present this to Lauren Sedata. Thank you for being so patient. Well, you can see how hard it is on you to be president. <laughs> As morning program chairman, I would like to thank the Charlie Gaines family for donating his president's plaque back so it could be used again. Charlie was given the plaque on June 14, 1962, when he was the 52nd president. And it was originally donated by the Grandview Chamber of Commerce. So thank you to the Charlie Gaines family. Are any of them here? Okay, since dad got the hat, we five kids, The hoop and holler kids. Got a little something from mom. Would you come up, please, mom? <laughs> She's worked tirelessly for the bluebirds. So we got her a turquoise bluebird pin. And I want to thank all our kids. I want to thank the son-in-law, Lyle. Stand up, Lyle. Lyle's been making bluebird houses. <clears throat> 358 we've just finished. We have one more bill to make, which will be about another hundred. She wants to say something else. <laughs> Those bluebird houses are stored at our house and they're free. <laughs> okay, if you're following the program, this is where we deviate just a little bit. Um, my poet could not make it that I had planned, um, so I have a fill in from last night. Um, Smoke Wade graciously has offered to do a couple of poems. Okay. He's part of the um, the entertainment that was here last night. Maybe he can tell you a little bit more about the group that he's involved in. Well, good morning. How is everybody from Bickleton, Washington today? Having a large time? Did any of you go to our show last night up here in the fighting cage? <laughs> All right. Good show, wasn't it? How many of you know a local community character named... Come out here. Ron, come out here. This, this involves you. Come on out here. Come here. Did any of you people know Ron? Ron is responsible for bringing the Cowboy Gathering, the Whispering Pines Cowboy Gathering, to the 98th Pioneer Picnic and Rodeo this year. We have had a tremendous time, but folks, as you all know, Ron is a well-known bull rider in his younger days. <laughs> And this morning, 
I let Ron know that I'm an old bronc rider. So we had breakfast today and we had one of those tough guy talk sessions where the first liar doesn't have a chance. <laughs> is about who had rode the toughest bulls and who had rode the meanest bronx and who had been in the nastiest bar brawls. And just when I thought that I came out on top and I was the toughest guy at the picnic this year, Ron says, smoke weight if you're so doggone tough, why don't you wear a pink shirt to the show today, ladies and gentlemen? How does that look? <laughs> thank, thank you. Well, my name's Smoke Wade, and I come from Mesquite, Nevada, which is like Bickleton, out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Anybody ever been to, or heard of Mesquite, Nevada before today? You been there? Play golf? Oh, oh you've been to Mesquite? All right. Well, it's good to be here. Listening to all these calves bawling over here reminded me of the days where I was born and raised in Hell's Canyon that we used to trail large herds of cattle out of the canyon as we followed the seasons from winter to summer grounds. It was not uncommon to trail in the springtime 1,100 head of steers for days on end. Our market was 90 miles away and we trailed the cattle to that. Those days are gone now, but we remember it in a poem. They moved often then from warm winter grounds by the river's mouth where mothers gave birth on rocky hillsides that faced the sunny south. Up steep trails they moved through saddles bathed in late spring showers above the canyons filled with pines to mountain meadows with purple flowers. Past green ponds they moved through huckleberries on the summit high and quickly down the devil's run to a land with endless sky. Through rolling hills they moved down dusty lanes in August sun to fall pasture with ample room for cows to rest and calves to run. Behind barbed wire now they move, there they fatten and they graze. You see the winter ground sit idle now in its modern times different ways. Yes, they moved often then through Shumac gullies and mountain streams before trailing the herd became a part of our memories and dreams. I'd like to say hi to all the queens and uh, Miss Moses Lake, you gals are looking particularly fine today. It's always a pleasure being at a rodeo event. Are you rodeo fans? Everybody stand for the rodeo? Are you ready for some rodeo? You bet. Uh, the morning's getting late, sun's getting hot. I have an event in Clarkston, Washington, and, uh, Washington I'm going to leave immediately for. So I'm going to close with this little ditty I did last night uh, about the banker. Any bankers? There's got to be a banker. Banker, throw your hand up where you at. Boy, they never have. There they are, three bankers up the corner. They've also been to Mesquite, Nevada, by the way. Play golf? Oh, oh bankers. You know, if you're in the livestock or farming industry, you cannot live with or without a banker, it seems like. I want to be a cowboy, said the banker Larry Brown, and live out in the country instead of cooped up here in town. When his wife got wind of this, she nearly went berserk. He made a hundred grand a year of doing banker's work. She said, you can't ride a horse, you can barely drive a jeep. <laughs> Why, the whole idea is dumber than a hundred head of sheep. <laughs> Ben said he'd teach me everything I need to know. How long can that take? There's just giddy up and whoa. <laughs> then he went to thumbing through a catalog of western wear and feed. His calculator humming, adding up the things he'd need. A thousand for a saddle? Well, there must be some mistake. A misprint, he reckoned. A grand, for heaven's sakes. Hat. 
vest, boots and spurs, and naturally a rope, bridle reins and silver bit, and a bar of saddle soap. Pick up and a trailer and a sort of odds and ends. Why, it's pretty darn expensive now, I'll tell you that, my friends. Saddle blanket, some underwear, oh yes, a pair of chinks. When you hit the total button, took an hour just to blink. <laughs> so that banker gave up on that cowboy scheme, and he says with some dismay, I can't afford to be a cowboy on a lousy banker's pay. <laughs> My name is Smoke Wade, and by the way, I am a legend in my own mind. It's been a pleasure being here. I hope to see you again next year. Thank you, Thank you Smoke. Appreciate you filling in. Drive safe. <clears throat> I haven't had much experience speaking publicly. I, I don't know if that's come across today, but... So I went on the internet. Wonderful thing, that internet. You can find just about anything you want to know about. But I've been told not to believe it all. So so kept looking and looking. And I, I found lots of suggestions and ideas on, on how to get comfortable speaking in front of a crowd. <clears throat> it said put the crowd at a disadvantage. So, okay, what, what can I do? So I keep reading. In, uh, they suggested that you look out at the crowd and just imagine everybody with no clothes on. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'm not sure that that's working for me. <laughs> Especially when I'm looking out here at my family in those color-coded shirts. <clears throat> Jan, would you like to come up and talk about the, uh, the omelet front? <laughs> Get me out of here, quick, save me. <laughs> Oh, you know what I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> uh, the endowment fund, um, sort of banker business actually, following that poem. Uh, what we've done over the, uh, since we've established the endowment fund, it's, it's a fund where it's a safety net for our pioneer ticket associate, the ACPA. And the money donated to that fund stays in that fund. If you donate $100 to the fund, $100 stays in the fund. So it's accrued that way. The interest is what is used by the Pioneer Association if needed. So far, we haven't had to tap into it. So it has grown and, um, and it's become a wonderful backstop for us to know it's there. And uh, if you are interested in donating to it, uh, you can make a donation to the ACPA here in Bickleton. To date, there is $34,584.37. So it has grown, and it's uh, certainly a viable part of our Pioneer Association to keep us going. Um, there are 108 names now on a plaque. When you donate to the, to the endowment fund, your name goes on a plaque or the name of someone you honor uh, in memory of someone, whatever, sometimes a special event is, is, uh, has been put on the plaque. It's to, to recognize the importance of the Pioneer Association and the fact that you want your family or uh, friends acknowledged on that. So now there are 108, 108 names on the plaque. It is located in the Carousel Museum and um, I encourage you all to take a look at it when you come by. Which leads me to the fact, and I'm just gonna stay right here, about the Curacao Museum. Um, <laughs> a year ago, we opened up, after countless hours and effort by a lot of local people, uh, on May the 1st of 2007, and we had no idea what to expect because we are out of the way and some distance from most population centers. Well, from May the 1st to October 12th, approximately 1,500 adults came through our door. So that's a, that's a wonderful response and, uh, and very encouraging to all of us. Uh, so it, it, uh, it's a wonderful year to have so many people interested in our museum, especially the carousel horses. We like to talk about the fact that they are so rare, over 100 years old, um, hand carved, and been restored by uh, efforts of, the, of our local community. People are amazed that we have such a museum piece here on those horses and the fact that we allow them to be used 
So, you know, that's one of our pitches. You come to here to Bickleton and you can get ride a 107 year old, uh, 100, over 100 years old, we know, uh, carousel horse. No, that's, uh, that's a pretty rare event. Uh, so, uh, our museum is really doing very well. We have a lot of groups who come through. Very often, they'll time the uh, buses, bus tours will come up, and they'll time their uh, ride up so that they can come to the museum and have lunch in town. So it benefits everybody. It's been a wonderful thing for our community. And I do want to thank uh, all the, the support from the volunteers all of you in the community who have, who've helped. So many people have stepped up. Uh, well over 5,000 hours of community effort. We keep track. So people have donated their skills. They have donated uh, just hours to stay with us and volunteers during our opening hours. And we just want to thank you one and all. It's just been wonderful. So um, that's our pitch. If you haven't been to the museum, Please come. If you have, come again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Now I'd like to introduce Ida for the memorial. <laughs> Ida May. <laughs> she didn't know I sang her. Mom, please come up. <laughs> almost forgot this. Are you going to blow the horn from there? Okay. <laughs> Time cannot steal the treasures that we carry in our hearts, nor ever dim the shining thoughts our cherished past imparts. Memories help keep us keep close to us, times that mean the most to us. <laughs> Martin Shattuck was not on last year's list. So we put him on this year's list. Jay Monroe, Mo Stewart. Cecil Wayne Jordan. Deborah Lynn Clark. Richard Dick Hutchins. Mrs. Fern Meyer Chamberlain, Art Merritt. Mrs. Velma Harold Chambers. Robert Bob Emery. Delbert Savage. Mrs. Frances Price Howard Steffens. Thomas Tommy West, Mrs. Violet Austin Jacobson, Frederick A. Siegfried, Mrs. Christine Max Taylor, Mrs. Maxine Robert McCauley, Mrs. Charlotte Evelyn Smith, Emery Lathrop, Delbert O'Neill Faulkner, Isla Mae Sanders, Twyla Kelly, Mrs. Clarice Smith Robert Ackrell, Mrs. Edith Edie Burris, Dwight Kelly, Mrs. Helen Mason Herb Sorensen, Mrs. Barbara Skaggs Guy Welty, Mrs. Irma Earl Williams, Mrs. Dorothy Mason Ralph Christian, Claire Pad Smith, Mrs. Phyllis Cooley Woodyard, and Ronald Faulkner and this is correct, both brothers were are on the list this year. Cousin Susan Wright with the uh, riderless horse. <coughs> Is there anything I forgot, Mom? Oh, more relatives snuck in after. Oh, the Bins, the Rasmussens, and all the outlaws and the in-laws. Mom wants to see all of you. Oh, and the Porters and the uh, the Churchills. Now they're tired. She thinks. <laughs> 
Jack, Tom, Dave. Last chance, boys. Okay. Greg, are you queued up, ready to go? Okay. Just a couple of quick notes to get out of here. Uh, niece Crystal is going to be playing as you leave. I feel free to stay and listen to her, but she's going to want to go eat. So, uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank you all for coming and uh, putting up with with us. See you at the dance tonight at eight, and uh, next picnic is June thirteenth and fourteenth, June next year. For your listening pleasure, I would like to dedicate this next little ditty to my brothers, Jack, John, and Jim. We were told no streaking, but nothing about singing. I stepped out of the shower, got a good look at myself. Hot bellied ball head, man, I thought it was somebody else. <laughs> I caught my reflection in the mirror on the back of my bathroom door and I just don't look good naked anymore. <laughs> so I'm going upstairs to turn the bedroom mirror to the wall. <laughs> I hung it there when I was trim and tall. I'd stand there and smile and strut and flex until my arms got sore. But I just don't look good naked anymore. Well, I used to go out with the girls. I loved them one and all. Now they don't get very close to me. They're afraid that I might fall. <laughs> well, I went to the doctor for my annual medical exam. Stood there in the buff. Suddenly he said, ma'am. <laughs> I said, what is it, Doc? Some fatal disease? I just got to know the score. He said, no, you just don't look good naked. <laughs> well, me and my wife had a dance routine. Everybody said it was unique. Now it's only when we're back to back that we're dancing cheek to cheek. <laughs> well, I went to a new beach for a little seaside fun. Stretched out in the birthday suit, soaking up the sun. Somebody yelled, hey, there's an old white whale washed up on the shore. I just don't look good naked anymore. Yeah, my heart just fell, my chest went to hell, and my butt's a drag in the floor. And I just don't look good naked anymore. Thanks for coming. Enjoy your day. Rodeo at 1 and tomorrow at 1. Thanks. <laughs>